welcome back to the Radical Book Fair Pavilion. I'm James Cannon, I'm a collective member at uh, Rowan's Bookstore and Coffee House, and I'm really happy to introduce uh, two authors who are here to speak to you today about um, subversion of traditional forms of digital media in very different ways. Um, we have Anna Anthropy on the left, who is the author of Rise of the Video Game Zine Spirits. Um, she is also a video game designer herself. She's done games like Mighty Chill Off and Dysphoria, um, both of which I'm pretty sure are still available for free online. Um, and our other guest today is uh, Craig Saber, uh, who's the author of books like Networked and Intimate Bureaucracies. Um, they both talk a lot in their work about um, subversion of digital media um, and using it for forms other than what they were originally meant for. However, they come from it in very different ways. This should be a very interesting talk. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to each of them for about 15 to 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open this up for um, Q&A. Uh, okay, Anna? Hello? Okay, that's good. Um, so, as the festival around us um, attests, the printing press has had incredible effects on the art and politics of, of the printed, printed word. Um, you know, Gutenberg made printed Bibles in languages other than Latin. Uh, Gutenberg printed pornography. Um, and that led to scenes and pamphlets and gazettes and, you know, a decentralization of printing um, and to all the literature that we have around us right now. And that's tremendous. And as a game designer, I spent a long time thinking about what the printing press or what a printing press for video games or for any kind of games could be because games as a form, as a you know, creative form, an art form, an expressive form, have been dominated for basically all of their history by a very small privileged minority, um, which is generally the small minority of you know, affluent uh, white dudes who in fact have the least amount of oppression to deal with. And, the, and video games as a form sort of reflect that. They're a monoculture. Every game sort of is informed by the same perspective. And it doesn't, it's not one that really tells us very much about the human experience or about our own experiences. So, um, I'm a queer game designer and uh, there aren't a, a lot of queer people making games, there aren't a lot of marginalized people involved in games creation. And what's keeping them from getting involved with what is you know, an, an entire new, wonderful, expressive form, there's technological barriers like the fact that um, programming, you know, teaching a computer to talk to you to play games requires lots and lots of training that is available to very few, um, and you know the, the tech, um, the tech industry scene is really, really misogynist and hostile to women. Um, there's there's barriers to distribution. Um, producing physical media is expensive, and distributing it is even more expensive. Um, that's, you know, that's the way that um, big games publishers position themselves as, as gatekeepers. Um, gatekeepers, gatekeepers, gatekeepers. Um, but I, the, the means of overcoming those gatekeepers, of getting, getting over that wall, exist now. There are free programs that are designed for people who are not professionals, who don't have engineering experience, like free programs like, like Twine, Stencil, tools like that that are freely available, um, that, you know, is starting to give non-professionals a voice. And also, the internet and cable, cable modems are giving people the means to self-publish 
and to self-distribute, you know, giving people the means to make video game zines. Um, and that's tremendous because the games that marginalized people, the people who are outside of the mainstream are making, look nothing like the model culture. I played a game last week by a queer trans woman about passing. I played a game by a mother a few months ago about coping, like how we cope with sexual assault. These are games that are more relevant to my life, maybe yours, um, than the space job violence of like most mainstream video games um, who are made largely by privileged white dudes for privileged white dudes. Um, so the means for people, like for anyone to empower themselves to, you know, become not just consumers but creators to work in this form are available. The problem, the last gatekeeper is that most people will never realize that those tools exist and that those means of distribution are available to them because the culture is just so hostile that most people are led to write off games entirely um, and will never be aware of where these resources exist and how to get their hands on them. Um, which is why I wrote this book. I just want to say to everyone out there in the back, um, the whiskey tasting, if you want to get whiskey, um, we'll be lining up and giving out numbers. Everyone here has their whiskey though. How, how's the whiskey in the back? Can you hear me in the back? How's the whiskey? Excellent whiskey. Thanks very much. I see we're bringing in some people from the outside. Um, and what I wanted to talk about was um, the way that uh, a prankster culture uh, existed in downtown New York City and um, one of the ways of doing that was to set up uh, fan clubs and uh, networks of people um, and uh, but I also wanted to experiment with uh, publishing and so um, what I did is uh, I wanted to publish a pamphlet um, about entrepreneurial communism uh, and there, there wasn't a huge market for that, but um, probably here is the entire market uh, and here for entrepreneurial communism. Uh, but I found that there was interest in um, a very isolated small group of people that wanted to publish um, on a very small scale, but reach a large audience. So um, what they did is basically one person started a press called Punctum Press and I started to talk to her about uh, doing this book. Another person uh, was running a press called Autonomedia and also uh, out of that a pamphlet series called Minor Compositions. And then finally uh, the, the big giant publisher was uh, AK Press and that was the biggest of the three um, and that uh, has offices here in Baltimore and um, you can buy the books right next door. So the idea was... Uh, oh. <laughs> so the idea was really to set up a way to figure out how we could um, uh, publish small pamphlets um, and to do that in a way that would be open access. So we, you can buy the book, and I do urge you again to buy it. I won't profit at all, but AK Press and Punctum Press will be able to at least sell more books. Uh, but the, the other thing you can do if you don't want to do that is just download it for free uh, by going to the press's site. So I'm also, the other thing that I'm interested in is open access politics. That is that what we want to do is move away from a marketplace of objects and money to a marketplace of ideas. And that is, we should be uh, evaluating games and scenes and ideas uh, according to uh, our, our judgments or our tastes, uh, and not simply about um, how many products we can move. So one of the ways to do that is to have it be open access. There are challenges to that, uh, because if there's no money, then you can't print books, but we can download the books. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the, that was sort of the context of the book. And uh, the actual book uh, is a pamphlet, really. And um, the pamphlet is about uh, real estate uh, in downtown New York City, uh, specifically about a group called Fluxus uh, that, as an art project, started something called uh, Flux House, which uh, which they would do is buy up a crumbling co-op building and uh, move in the artists there uh, because no one else really wanted to live in those really horribly decrepit buildings. And uh, they bought up, uh, by the end, they had bought up 90 buildings. And uh, they also wanted to stage, um, uh, they also bought their food cooperatively. Uh, and uh, they tried to turn in a, a part of New York City and Manhattan into a, basically an artist uh, collective. Uh, and um, by the end, they had bought up 90 buildings. Um, unfortunately, and here's a life lesson to be learned, is that uh, they had to deal with other types of bureaucracies. Uh, one, of, one of their messages was, do it yourself. How many of you have heard of do it yourself? Didn't know that that was going to leave, that could be a matter of life and death. Um, that the mob said, no, you don't do it yourself, you hire our workers, or we're going to break your knees and punch it and, and kill you. Um, and they said, but we're just artists. We're just innocent, romantic artists. We believe in do it yourself. How many of you believe in do it yourself? And the mob said, well, that's fine. And they beat, they beat George Machunas so badly that he lost his left eye and he later died uh, from his injuries. So there's a life lesson to be learned there that, that just doing your art, which could just be do it yourself, could have consequences. So what I was interested in was the idea of dealing with structures like bureaucracies, uh, like the mob, um, like uh, the city of New York, which also at first wanted to shut them down. There's some great stories which I could go into off camera where Machunis would steal electricity and try to figure out how to basically run this operation. Um, but the idea was to set up a bureaucracy, which we think of as cold and faceless, much the same way that games we think of as being sort of these monolithic structures, to do it in a way that would be more resembling a, a, a friendly, intimate relationship that we might have. And so, what they tried to do was to set up intimate bureaucracies. And so this would be the final life lesson is that I wanted to work with publishers. I wanted to work with bureaucracies. I love bureaucracies. I'm a bureaucrat. I'm an administrator at a university. I work for the state. I have my papers with me. I carry them around. I've been in unions, etc. I mean, you, bureaucracies aren't the problem. The problem is that bureaucracy should be occupied. The same way that Anna was talking about occupying a form uh, that is available, which is games, and figuring out what is the intimate potential of that kind of bureaucracy. Anyway, I told James to sit in that chair and smoke cigarettes like we were on some kind of talk show. Maybe he could do that. He could come over here and sit somewhere. So anyway, that's my uh, that's why I wanted to do this book to, to do an intimate bureaucracy myself.